Well, hello, and now we are going to talk about glomerular filtration. So we're in chapter 20 of the urinary system. And so since we're talking about the urinary system, we're talking about the system that forms urine. And the main, uh, the main functional unit is the nephron. The nephrons are what are going to produce this urine. They're going to filter uh, the blood as it goes through them. Um, and as they do it, they will uh, dump that fluid on the collecting ducts, and then the collecting ducts will be removed. And once it is in the minor calyx that we've looked at and on its way out, it is then called urine. Um, urine is going to contain a lot of waste. That's what the main idea is. And it's going to, you're going to get rid of excess water. It's all about water balance, too, because water balance, again, as soon as you think of this, um, you should remember the thing called osmosis because what it's doing is trying to regulate the water concentration of your body so that osmosis is always uh, in its proper balance. And then electrolytes, so stuff like especially hydrogen ions. And, um, you know, when we talk about hydrogen ions, you should always think of pH, right? pH, the uh, remember that the, the H is always capital because uh, pH is all about uh, the concentration of hydrogen ions. So um, that's kind of what it's doing, the basic overviews. There's other things that kind of go on that we'll look at, but there's three processes in forming urine. Uh, one of them is called glomerular filtration. This is what's going to happen in the glomerulus. And then along the tube, there's going to be two processes. One's called reabsorption. Those are things that have been filtered here that we don't want to get rid of, and they get pulled back into the circulatory system. And then something called tubular secretion, things that couldn't get filtered here and we need to get out. So tubular secretion is going to have uh, the capillary bed pushing the the things that didn't get filtered in the glomerulus into the tubule for excretion. So in this picture, we're going to kind of look at what's going on. It gives a better idea. Again, this is nothing like how the uh, nephron looks, but it's a good diagram so we can understand it. We've got, again, the afferent arterial bringing the blood into the glomerulus. As the, as the blood goes into the glomerulus, a lot of the plasma carrying electrolytes and waste products and all kinds of other things get filtered. At this point, this is called glomerular filtration. That's what's happening. Right? So as the glomerular filtration is happening, the fluid that is being pushed out here is called filtrate. Now, the blood that has been filtered is going to exit on what we call the efferent arterial, right? And now the efferent arterial right away is going to turn into the paratubular capillary, and it's going to run and pretty much hug right next to this tube. And so there's going to be this little process where we're going to have a give and take uh, of things that have been filtered and haven't been filtered. So uh, we've said that uh, in one of the previous ones that there's about 180 liters of water, of fluid, get filtered here every 24 hours. Now, again, we do not urinate 180 liters every 24 hours. That would be terrible. We, in general, we're going to urinate about a liter, a little bit less probably. So a lot of this water that gets filtered is going to be reabsorbed. So the process is called tubular reabsorption. So as this filtrate enters in here, some things get pulled back in and taken into uh, the circulatory system. And again, that is called tubular reabsorption. And then there are other things that are in here that we want to get rid of, and they they didn't get rid of, they didn't get out in the tubular uh, in the glomerular filtration. So we have what's called tubular secretion. That's when things that are in this paratubular capillary bed need to get out, so they get pushed into here. So I have these three areas that we looked at in the previous slide. We have tubular filtration, we have tubular re or <laughs> glomerular filtration over here. I am so sorry. Glomerular filtration, which is happening in the glomerulus, and simply where the plasma is being pushed out, and now it has formed something called filtrate. 
then this filtrate, some of it gets pulled back into the capillary, and that's called tubular reabsorption. Some of it gets pushed out of the capillary into the tube, and that is called tubular secretion. Now, glomerular filtration, which it says is the first step of urine formation, this is happening in the glomerulus, um, it is going to be um, pretty much, as it says down here, it's called filtrate, and it has about the same composition of tissue fluid because the cells don't get out. The, the, um, the red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets, erythrocytes, leukocytes, thrombocytes, do not are too big to be pushed across, so it's mainly just the fluid. And so it's the same as a normal capillary bed as far as the composition in a lot of ways. Um, so that's why it's the same composition as tissue fluid. Now, um, as it says here, water in the small dissolved molecules and ions can be filtered, but the larger molecules, such as large proteins, we talked about this in the, uh, in the blood chapter. This is going to be like the uh, albumin that we talked about. It, and if you can remember, which I, have, I understand if you don't, but when we looked at the plasma proteins, we talked about albumin as this big protein that helps establish osmosis. And that's because it can't get filtered. So because it can't get filtered, it's going to cause the blood that stays in the circulatory system in these capillaries, whether it's the glomerulus or just a normal capillary, to have this big osmotic pull on it. Um, and so, again, they remain in there because they're too large to pass through the little slits. Um, now, the, they're going, the capillaries in this glomerulus are going to have... Uh, a lot more permeable permeability, uh, a lot a greater permeability than a normal capillary bed because they're going to have these little holes. They're really, you know, for you and I we would call them pores, but of course everything in science has to have a much more uh, elaborate name. So they're called finstrae here, but it's simply that's just the the Latin word for a pore. Um, so as these as the blood goes through the glomerulus, these little fenstra and pores allow for more of the fluid to get out. So that's why there's a greater amount of fluid in the glomerulus that leaves than in a normal capillary bed. This is kind of showing the, the makeup of it. This is the glomerulus. Uh, as it goes through here, we're going to look in a little bit at these little cells called podocytes. Uh, poto uh, means foot. We had talked about these in a previous um, in a previous uh, video that they have these little feet-like extensions, and you kind of see how they intermesh with each other here, and they allow for a regulation of how much uh, filtrate is formed. Because if we want, if something happens and we're like dehydrated or or whatever, we want to kind of shut down our kidneys. One of the things is. Uh, when we switch over to the sympathetic nervous system, we want to stop the filtration process as much as we can. So these little podocytes will take those little toes, those feet-like appendages, and close them down to, to help uh, li eliminate some of the openings, and it, it regulates and li uh, limits the amount of filtrate that's formed. Um, so that's how our body regulates it. And here you can kind of see you got all of these little uh, pores, which we again we call finstrae, and then the podocytes are all around it and they help regulate that. So when we talk about how this um, filtrate is formed, there are three forces that are um, involved in it. So reading through here, the main force that moves substances by filtration through the glomerular cap, uh, capillary wall is hydrostatic pressure, uh, or said another way, since we're talking about this, blood pressure inside the glomerulus. The afferent arteriole has a larger diameter than the efferent arteriole. We talked about this kind of before. So I've got this incoming um, artery. It's going to go through this crazy little thing called a glomerulus, and then I'm going to have a much thinner or narrower efferent arteriole. Now that's going to back up pressure that's going to cause more pressure inside here to cause more of the uh, filtrate to be formed, and that kind of helps. Resistance in the efferent arteriole, as it says, increases the blood pressure 
or hydrostatic pressure in the glomerulus, which favors filtration. It would be like if I had a, if I had a, a hose and I have a cut in the hose here, and then on the other side of it, I've kind of put pressure here, you know, and kind of squeeze it. It builds pressure up here, so I'm going to have more water squirting out of it. And so that's kind of the same basic idea. So when we look at this, there's three things that are involved in it. Uh, the force that is favoring filtration, which is the largest one, is glomerular capillary hydrostatic pressure, which just means the blood pressure inside the glomerulus. Then we're going to have two forces that are going to be against it. And these two will explain capillary osmotic pressure inside of it and the capsular hydrostatic pressure. Now, two things. If I was to draw, if I was to draw this here, and I'm going to put this, and I'm just going to put one uh, little loop here. Um, as a matter of fact, let me try to redraw this. Um, I'm just going to put inside of it, I'm just going to put one big loop instead of trying to draw that weird, um, crazy thing. All right, so blood's coming through this little tube here. All right, afferent arterial, efferent arterial. The pressure inside of here is pushing the fluid out. But as this fluid kind of moves through here, more and more of the plasma has been removed. So by the time we get to this side, this the blood in here is going to be very concentrated. And so it's going to have this osmotic draw that's going to be wanting to pull fluid back in. And so this is the capillary osmotic pressure. All right, and we're going to look at a picture in the next slide that'll probably be uh, make it easier, but I don't know why I started drawing this. But so this area over here is going to, as, as the blood continues to lose the plasma in its filtrate, I'm going to have this much more osmotic pressure that's going to try to pull the fluid in. And even beyond that, it's going to actually make it to where it's harder for the fluid on this side to be pushed out because it's going to want to hold on to it. And then the other one called capsular hydrostatic pressure is going to be that the fluid that's already in here is going to form a resistance from the fluid trying to be pushed out. And, and I guess we could kind of think of, you know, if I have a balloon that is full all the way and I try to blow more air into it, the air that's already in there is going to kind of be a resistance. And so that's what it's talking about, the, the capsular hydrostatic pressure. So let's see if this next picture kind of makes it a little more clear than my scratches there. So I've got on this one again, we're looking at, at how this works. I've got blood flow going this way, right? Over on this end, again, we're going to have 55% um, plasma, 45% formed elements. That's the normal composition. And as it moves through, this 55% is going to start decreasing because I'm going to be removing the fluid. That's what the, the filtrate is, right? So on this side, let's just say that it is um, for, it, it switched, it's reversed, 45% plasma and now 55% formed elements. To be honest with you, I should know the actual ratio, but I really don't. All right, so I've removed some of the fluid out here and it's going to be removed by the pressure that's inside here. And again, remember the pressure is created because this little area on this side is going to be narrower. So it's building up the pressure behind it. So I have glomerular um, hydrostatic pressure. This is going to be the pressure inside the glomerulus, which is the capillary bed, the blood pressure inside there. Then I'm going to have resistance. There's two resistance. The first one I'm going to just kind of look at is capsular hydrostatic pressure. So there's fluid out in here, and I'm trying to push fluid into a contained area. So as I'm pushing that fluid into the contained area, it's going to have resistance, and that is capsular hydrostatic pressure. And then the other one is called plasma colloid osmotic pressure, or the osmotic pressure that's in the blood. It is going to, since I'm losing fluid, 
That means I'm making a more concentrated fluid as it moves through. Concentrated fluid by dilute fluid, which out here it's dilute. I'm just going to put dill. <laughs> Uh, dilute because all that's coming out here and being pushed out is basically water with small ions. So I'm going to have a big osmotic draw in the blood as it goes through here. And so it's going to try to pull fluid in or I said another way, it's going to resist fluid being pushed out. So those are the three types. I've got an outward force called a glomerular hydrostatic pressure, which is the blood pressure inside the glomerulus and two inward forces. One is the plasma colloid osmotic pressure, which is the pressure inside the glomerulus, the osmotic pressure inside there, trying to resist having fluid leave. And then the capsular hydrostatic pressure, or the, the fluid pressure that's inside the capsule that is already there that's resisting the fluid being pushed out. Hopefully those three kind of make sense. Now the filtration rate is uh, pretty amazing. I've, we've, I've said this a couple of times, 180 liters a day. Um, 180 liters a day. Think about that, 92 liter Coke bottles every 24 hours gets filtered through um, your kidneys. And so um, it, is gonna, it, is, it is pretty amazing. And, and as it says here, your blood on average is going to be filtered 60 times a day. Um, and so as we do this, there's only a small percentage of urine that we produce. So the majority of all of this gets reabsorbed, as we talked about with that tubular reabsorption. Now this is the last slide on this. Um, the um, filtration rate is controlled by a process called autoregulation. Uh, autoregulation just means that um, it is self-regulating. It has built-in automatic reflexes that help the process. Um, so certain conditions may increase or decrease glomerular filtration rate within the limits in order to maintain homeostasis, such as when glomerular filtration rate increases in cases of body, excess body fluids. Um, but there's going to be mechanisms responsible for keeping this constant as it can. First of all, it's called autoregulation. Again, our body's going to, we'll show a little bit later on how it works to help regulate it. Um, the sympathetic nervous system actually uh, is going to um, affect it by causing the afferent and arterial, uh, efferent arterioles to constrict simultaneously. Uh, and so that's going to try to help lower um, and kind of change that, that uh, glomerular filtration rate. And again, doing that as accordance to blood pressure conditions. Um, we'll get into this a little bit in, in as far as this right here because this is big uh, this is a big uh, system that is started by this thing called renin that is released inside the kidney uh, that our body anytime anybody is on blood pressure medication they have to take things basically that helps uh, to stop this system because this system is set up to help raise blood pressure in times of uh, hemorrhaging and stuff like that. So anyway, we'll talk about that when we get there. And then we're going to have things like the hormones, other hormones. These are hormone-like. Uh, I want to make that clear. But then we have hormones um, that are going to help, that are going to control filtration rate. One of them is called the atrial nitritic peptide. Now what the word atrial means, we learned that in the heart. Remember in the heart we had um, the two, oops, there we go, drawn of the heart. I divided into sections. The two upper chambers are called atrium. The two lower chambers are called ventricles. So we have a ventricular nitritic peptide and an atrial nitritic peptide. The one I want you to concentrate on is this atrial nitritic peptide. Because what happens is if I drink, if I've been drinking a lot of fluid and I'm not sweating, I'm, the fluid has to go, it gets absorbed, has to go through the circulatory system. The heart will realize that I have an increased volume because it's going to feel that pressure. And the atrium, which doesn't have a lot of muscle, is going to feel this stretch on its walls. And when it does, it's going to release a hormone that's going to go to the kidneys 
and cause the kidneys to start increasing their urine production to get rid of the extra water. So that's how we're going to control some of these uh, filtration rates. And again, we'll kind of get more in depth in each of these as we go along.